This is Real Talk with Coach Reed Live, and it's been a lot going on in college football the last 48 hours, but something breaking happened today with the firing of Brian Harson as the Auburn football coach. So I'm going to bring on two guys that I think know a little bit about Auburn football. First, I got my guy Tyler Citrullo, who's an Auburn grad, and as well was on the recruiting staff for Gus Malzahn during Gus Malzahn's tenure as the head football coach. And my guy, a lifelong Alabama resident, Kyron Samuels, also Gridiron Heroics is his show. Make sure you tap in with him. Guys, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So, guys, I want to touch on this first and foremost before we before we go too far off. It's been no secret for the last several weeks, probably since the beginning of the season, that nobody thought Brian Harson would make it to through the season. And every week it was like, when is the week? When is the week? Auburn makes a move and hires their AD. And the very next day, Harson gets the ax. Now, Tyler, I'm going to start here with you first. Why did it not work for Brian Harson at Auburn? Man, there's a lot of reasons it didn't work. Um, but I think it just boils down to it was not a natural fit. You know, Alan Green took a, took a chance. And at the time, I thought it was a good idea to hire somebody that didn't have previous Auburn ties or was, wasn't a part of Gus's staff. And I think a lot of people kind of agree with that sentiment. But it came even further from left field than I think people had thought it would. And if you talk to high school coaches around the state of Alabama, which I'm sure you have in Georgia, he didn't recruit. They didn't have the they had the they had the good pieces in place and they had the idea of the infrastructure that you needed to succeed. But they were just were not recruiting. He was skipping team um, recruiting dinners. He was not showing up to high schools. He wasn't calling schools. There was an article today published by, I think, two for the 247 affiliate for Auburn talking about how he just was not on the trail. Um, and, you know, there's guys like Cadillac, who is now the interim head coach, who can recruit. Zach Etheridge can recruit and some support staffers. But you got to have dudes in the SEC to win. And they were not getting dudes. And there was some talent deficiencies on the roster coming into his tenure at Auburn. Um, but he didn't fix them. And he had opportunities, especially in the present day with the transfer portal and the grad transfers, the extra COVID year. And it just it just never worked out. Kyron, going to you, are you hearing similar things about Brian Harson's inability to recruit the state in the surrounding areas? What do you think some of the hangups were? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm hearing that, especially, you know, I'm from South Alabama, the 251 area where um, Auburn has historically done great. I mean, you look at guys like uh, Nick Fairley in the past and just a couple guys like that. Um, he's not hitting the hot spots. You know, when you go to a, a university like Auburn, especially somewhere in the SEC, um, you're going to have to compete with Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, now Lane Kiffin, Mike Leach. Um, I could go on and on and on. If you aren't hitting the recruiting trail hard, if you aren't putting guys like Trevon Reed, who is a former Auburn player, NFL player, that is there um, in a player relations role, if you're not putting guys like that in the forefront um, to help you recruit, uh, you're at a disservice from, from day one. And, and that's what I'm hearing from him. And, you know, I thought that he would hit, you know, junior college more, transfer portal more, because – you are behind the eight ball now. You don't have as long as you used to to get it right. So the fact that he wasn't hitting the trail hard enough, and like Tyler said, it's more of a, a fit thing. You should know that coming in. I'm going to be competing with these guys uh, as far as the coaches. I need to be the one being proactive and, and going overboard with the recruiting process. Yeah, I think – and one, I'll add one more thing. I think he came in with the mentality that he could do things the same way that he did in Idaho and Boise, and it doesn't <laughs> work like that. The number one thing you got to do down here is learn and adapt. Um, and I think you're seeing that even with Brian Kelly recently. Right. Um, and he just he wanted to do things the same way. And I think he thought he could poach people from all over the country that were maybe lesser talented players coming out and believed in his player development process. But, man, you got to have dudes that can be impact players from day one. Now, let me ask you guys this, because I, I want to be a devil's advocate here for a second, because my next question is going to be, Tyler, and I'm going to start with you. Does Auburn have unrealistic expectations from their coach? Gene Chizik, national champion, fired. Gus Malzahn was the OC on that team, gets the head job, takes Auburn to the national championship game, loses in the national championship game in Florida State. Nobody, they, they hated on him every year. Every year was complaints about Gus Malzahn. Eventually, he gets fired. Now, a very close friend of mine told me, Carl, the problem with Auburn is 
they don't realize that they're just an eight-win football program who can have occasional success. They think that they're supposed to be Alabama and win national championships every year. Tyler, are the expectations of the Auburn fans and boosters realistic? This is a conversation that I have had with people since as long as I can remember. But the expectations are probably too high, but they should be at the same time, right? You know, if you if, if you don't, if Bo Jackson used to say, "Set your goals high," and if you, if they you strive to get there, if you don't get there, they weren't, or if you got there, they weren't high enough. So um, I think the expectations are a little bit too high. But you pointed out like the Chiswick, the Ch when things go south quickly, like they are with Harson, it may be time to just cut your ties and move on quicker. The Gus thing was a little different because like you said even after 2014 people were having questions right we lost the home game to texas a&m and people were already saying all right it's over it's over and that was in his second year a year removed from the national championship so the expectations are probably too high but i do think they need to be high especially when you're seeing what Alab alabama is the rare case of being a dynasty right the best dynasty that we've seen in arguably any sports history ever and at any level but now you see Georgia winning a national championship. LSU hired another coach and won a national championship. Tennessee seems they're having a quick turnaround. Clemson's been able to build a little bit of a sustainable success down there. So I think the pressure is rising. So the expectations probably increase just by being tied to all those programs. Kyron. But Auburn is not an eight-win program. Auburn, <laughs> Auburn is a better than an eight-win program. <laughs> you know, because – my buddy says that, that Auburn is the Iowa of the South, and they should be happy with that. I'll disagree I disagree with that. With that yeah. You disagree? <laughs> I disagree. kindly disagree with that. All right, Kyron, Kyron, you disagree with it. Talk to me. Well, I disagree with it because if you look at the, the history over the last 10 years, we talk about those giants in Alabama. We talk about those giants uh, of the last five, six years uh, in Georgia, LSU. Auburn has had more success against those programs than anybody else in the country. So the expectations are high because they have no choice to be that high. You were going up against Nick Saban once a year. You were going up against Kirby Smart once a year. Um, they have no choice but to live up to unrealistic expectations. And more, more often times than not, they, they've met there. Let's, let's have real talk. This is real talk to read. They've been there more times than they haven't been. Um, and the Gus Malzahn thing, like he said, he could talk about it more than I can, but Gus Malzahn was, what, four and five against Saban? He had four wins against Saban? That's significantly better than anybody else in the last two decades. So um, they've had success. They've proven that they have the, the donor pool and the, and the money to uh, – I don't want to say too much here, but they can recruit with anybody in the country if they have the right pieces in place. So the expectation should be high, and if you're looking at the future, the future is pretty bright for the program, in my opinion. So – now let, let's talk a couple of the candidates. My, my colleague, Brandon Marcello, on the show we did earlier today, he's been dropping the bomb all day. He says Lane Kiffin is the number one target for Auburn right now. Kyron, you love it or you hate it? <laughs> Listen, man, I'm one of the biggest Lane truthers on the planet. I absolutely love it. Um, and there's some other guys that I think should be the more real, should be the more desirable candidate. But if we're talking about realistic and we're talking about somebody who is familiar with the SEC, it's an interdivision swap. He would be going somewhere. It wouldn't even be across division lines. He's coming right from Ole Miss to Auburn if that were to happen. He's proven he's a winner. Everywhere he went, everywhere he goes, the offense breaks records. Not just They're not just successful. They break records. Um, he's always proven to recruit with the best of them. Ole Miss has great resources, right? But they don't have more resources than some of the other programs he's going up against. And he continually plucks guys from the top of the recruiting rankings and from the top of the transport uh, for portal the last two years since the portal's been open. So I think Lane Kiffin should be one of the very high guys up on that list. And I love that. I think it's a very good move for Auburn. Is it the same for Lane? Is it a lateral move for him? That remains to be seen. But for Auburn, he should definitely be up there for them. Tyler, love it or hate it? I love it. But – I, I, I've seen a lot of chatter calling Ole Miss and Auburn a lateral move, and people are only using the last two years of records as the, for the example <laughs> and for that because they do not compare. We've seen an Ole Miss to Auburn jump before with Tommy Tuberville in the past as well. So it's not it wouldn't be something that we haven't seen before. But Ole Miss hasn't ever even made it to Atlanta for an SEC championship. So let's cut to the chase. They are not, they are not the same. Ole Miss got their first win against Auburn this year and the first time since 2015 when Hugh Freeze was there. So these two programs, the resources, oh, I like what Ole Miss is. 
than what Lane's done there, but they're not the same. I do think Lane would be a good hire for Auburn, obviously, and I think he'd be able to turn things around the quickest out of any other candidate that's been mentioned out there. Just with his ability to win the portal, like we saw last year, they were arguably the portal winners from the 2022 season. So I think he would be able to hit that and Auburn could turn around quicker, uh, quickly. Auburn wants to be fun again, too. Auburn wants offense. I'm the biggest Gus advocate out there, but we lost some we lost some momentum. We lost some firepower. We lost excitement with Gus's offense, too. And I think Auburn people really are looking to get that back, too. And we all know that Lane Kiffin could bring that. So I'm, in, I'm all in for it. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm not going to get my hopes up for anything yet, though. Now, Kyron, you mentioned that there's a couple other guys you like. If you, were gonna, if you weren't going to go with Lane and you were going to go with one other guy, who would you look at? I mean, it has to be Deion Sanders, right? I mean, the potential for recruiting there. Recruiting is the lifeblood of any program. Could you imagine Deion Sanders with that donor base, with that pool, with the ability to lock down Atlanta areas, the southern Alabama area, which has been historically great for them, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Florida areas. And then who, who wouldn't want to transfer for, to go play for prime? Who wouldn't want to come to the Plains to get a chance to go play for, uh, against Nick Saban and Kirby Smart every year? Um, could you imagine they're already doing commercials together, the athletic commercials. <laughs> Can you imagine Nick Saban versus uh, Deion Sanders Iron Bowls, the build up, what that would be? Um, I think it's too great of an opportunity, the upside, to not put every feather in your cap if you're at Auburn and go all in on Deion Sanders because it might be unconventional. It may be something that you're not used to. But the return on investment or the prospect of that is too great to pass up. You have to go all in on a guy like that. And he's proven another thing that I really wanted to give him a shout-out for. He can assemble a, rec- a staff, coaching staff top to bottom and recruiting staff top to bottom. Even if you have questions about his abilities with X's and O's, which I have no doubts. I mean, he's an NFL Hall of Famer, one of the best we've ever seen. Why wouldn't he be football savvy? But even if you did, he's proven that he knows who to get to put in the right places. And that's a superpower in and of itself. So, like I said, I think uh, Lane is a great option. But if I were the, the people making the decision, Prime is my number one pick. Tyler, give me another name other than Lane Kiffin. Is a guy that you would that you like at the Auburn job? Yeah, and I think I mean Dion's the obvious choice, right? And I, I'm I'm a full advocate for that because, like I said at the beginning, it takes dudes to it, take, it takes dudes to win. And I think there's one guy in the country who could walk things down in recruiting against Kirby and Nick, and it's probably Dion, to be honest with you. Um, and the difference between I think Dion and Lane is I think Lane isn't wouldn't be as much as a builder through the high school pipeline as Dion. I think Dion would really win high school recruiting. And I think they would equal out in with the portal, if that makes sense. Um, but outside of those two, because those are, I mean, those would be at the two top of my list because I think Auburn has to, they have to galvanize the fan base and they have to get everybody on the same page and getting a big time hire is the way to do that. We don't know if it's going to work, right? Hindsight's always 2020, but getting someone like Jimmy Chaldwell from, Coastal Carolina, no disrespect. He's probably a great football coach, but the fan base and the boosters are still going to be divided. We're still going to have the same issues that we've always had, right? And no one getting full full scale support. Um, you know, Jeff Grimes has been mentioned a lot from Baylor. I think he would fix a lot of the um, offensive line issues that Auburn's had the past few years. I would be very concerned about some of his schematic things, not to get too technical that he would bring, but I don't know if again the fan base would be too very energized and galvanized about that. So my top two are Lane and Dion. Another name I throw out there, I think this is going to, it's way from left field, but Brian Hartline. And that might be one that people look at and like, whoa, that's, that's, what are we doing here? You know, this guy's never even met a coordinator, but we want a recruiter, right? And this guy has shown that he is the pure best recruiter at his position group in the entire nation. And he's going to get a head coaching job at some point in time. So maybe Auburn's his first one. Ooh. And Gil, and one more thing I'll add, his brother is an analyst on staff at Auburn right now, so you never know. Ooh. Zone six to the planes? Whoa. <laughs> hey, I'm going to call Brian Hartline tonight when we get through recording. I, I, I ask him, <laughs> is, it any, is it any smoke to this? Brian Hartline, you know, big-time receiver coach. Um, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Somebody's going to pick him up this year. So before we get out of here, huge SEC game in the East, Georgia. Tennessee, the winner of this is going to be in the driver's seat, obviously, for a playoff berth, um, depending on what happens in the SEC championship game. Now, I went to college at Austin P. State University with all of the, in the state of Tennessee. And, you know, all my buddies from Tennessee are, are telling me, are bombarding me because they all love the volunteers. 
Tyler, I'm going to start with you. Can Tennessee take out Georgia this week in Athens? They absolutely can. Do I think they ultimately do? No. Uh, I got too much concerns about their defense. They're, they showed up and they played really well against Kentucky. I didn't think that their defense would play that well against Kentucky, but I think Georgia's just going to be able to out physical them late in that ball game. I think it's going to be high scoring and close, but Georgia's run game is going to, I think, outwin that. But I will add, it's nice to have an actual marquee SEC matchup for the first time in how many years. I'm glad they're picking up, um, picking up some slack on that side of the division this year. <laughs> Kyron, what, give me, give me Georgia, Tennessee. What are your thoughts? Um, so I, I'm more aligned with TJ's line of thinking. I think that Georgia is too balanced. Uh, if you look at the numbers real quick, uh, Georgia is the number two in total offense, uh, number six in scoring, and then number two in total defense and number two in scoring defense. Conversely, Tennessee is number one in every identifiable offensive category, right? We know how great they are, how, how, how high power they are. So you look at the defense, they're 26th in scoring defense and 82nd in total defense. So games aren't won on paper, but like TJ said, at the end of the day, I think they have more dudes on both sides of the ball, and I think they're going to win the coaching matchup as well uh, because I don't think that tempo is going to affect Georgia like it affects most teams. And, and Hendon Hooker is going to have to make their throws. A lot of his throws um, and the offense has been schemed open beautifully. These aren't difficult throws to make. These aren't difficult catches to make. We're going to see them have to win difficult plays this week, and we haven't seen it yet, even in the Alabama game. Um, most of those plays were explosive plays. I, I'm interested to see how the Tennessee offense uh, goes up against that defense where you're going to have to make those hold throws. They're going to have those two high safeties back there, and you're going to have to make those tough decisions. So I'm more aligned with TJ. I think Georgia pulls it out in the end, and I don't think it's particularly close. I'm saying 34-17. Oh, wow. I will say that Georgia, Georgia's got some injury concerns that fear me. I, I saw Nolan Smith might be out. Jalen Carter's still banged up. You know, he's arguably one of the best players in the country. Uh, A.D. Mitchell has been out for a while. I think he's their best receiver. So Georgia's got some injury questions, but um, I think the home crowd is actually going to play a big factor in that as much as it pains me to say. Last game we're going to talk about. Let's go to the west side of the division. We got Alabama, LSU. All right. Tyler, give me the winner. Alabama, LSU. LSU, and I don't mean to slight what they've done in recent weeks, but th- – Auburn should have beat them and Auburn is not very good. And, I, you know, and so I think Alabama has gotten right over the bye week. I think they've gotten a little healthier and I think they're going to, I think they might win this game by 17 to 21 points. Honestly, um, Brian Kelly has really turned things around from earlier in the season. Um, so credit them and credit their staff. Um, but I just think they're going to struggle in the past game, which is Alabama's deficiency, right? We saw against Tennessee, they don't, they don't defend the pass very well, but um, they can stop the run, and I think they will stop the run, and uh, Jane and Daniels may have a long night. Kyron, what we got? Alabama, LSU. Bryce Young starts to get his highs and chatter right back up after this game. Bryce Young has a field day. Um, I'm more aligned with TJ here. I'm saying 42, 42 to 21-ish. I think they win big, wow. and I have a lot of respect for the uh, LSU program. I think Brian Kelly's actually done a pretty damn good job this year. However, it's a different beast. You know, you're going, you're going up against a different beast right here. As long as Bryce Young's on the field, I'm taking him, or at least predicting Bama to win every game from here on out. But uh, I think Bama takes care of business, and I don't think it's really that close. LSU and Tennessee fans that are watching this, please direct your hate mail to Kyron. <laughs> Kyron Samuels, please direct your hate mail to him. Do not DM me. I didn't say it. <laughs> he said it. But this is real talk. With Coach Reed live, Kyron Tyler, thank you for joining us today. We are appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us.